All right. So the title of my sermon this morning is Make Christianity Biblical Again. And if it sounds familiar, you probably heard the slogan from the Trump campaign. You're probably sick of it by now. I, I, you know, we've heard it for, for well over a year now. What's well, been two years or whatever, however long it takes to campaign and do the election, do all that stuff. And of course, his slogan was Make America Great Again, right? But if there's ever going to be a move to make America great again, it won't happen with political elections. It must come through the churches. It must come through the preaching of God's word to get to the heart of the people because politically you can't fix our problems, our real problems. Amen. We're not, you know, our real problems ultimately have nothing to do with the economy. Our real problems in this country have to do with the morality and the, the downward spiral into depravity that this country is facing. And if we're going to get, if we're ever going to become great again, if America's ever going to be respected in the world again, it's going to have to come through the hearts and the minds and the souls of the individuals within the nation and people who love God, who want to make the Lord their God and are willing to serve God. That's the only way, the only hope we have for this country to be great again. It has to start in church. We need to push for people to get right with God. In order for that to happen, there has to be preachers that are willing to preach the whole counsel of God. Without that, it's not going to happen. People need leaders to follow. People need strong leadership within churches and, and strong churches that are not afraid. They're not going to buckle to the pressures of Satan and his minions. Because that's what's going on today. There's been a lot of brainwashing going on and, and a, lot of, uh, a lot of efforts to, to basically it's just been a, a spiritual battle, a spiritual war that's been taking place against churches and against people of God and trying to soften down the Bible, trying to, trying to, to make it not very, um, not very well known. Most people don't even read their Bibles and don't know their Bibles. But this is why we started out here in Isaiah chapter 58, verse number 1. The Bible says, Cry aloud, spare not. Lift up thy voice like a trumpet and show my people their transgressions in the house of Jacob their sins. We need churches today to be willing to stand on God's word, to be willing to cry aloud. Spare not means don't hold back. Don't withhold God's word. People need to hear about their transgressions. I mean, think about this. It only makes sense. If we want God to bless America, we are going to need to make sure that we are living righteously, that we are listening to God, and that we are getting our act together. Why would God ever choose to bless a country of people who just turn their necks, they don't listen to anything that, that God's actually telling us. We have God's word at our disposal in the, in the Bible. We have every word of God. Yet so many people just allow this book to collect dust in their homes. And those same people get all excited about the political rallies while their Bible's collecting dust, while they're going out and just living like the world. And they expect God to, to bless our country or bless our nation for some reason. Why would he choose to do that? A, a, a country that's increasingly rejecting God, throwing the Ten Commandments out of the courtrooms, getting the Bible out of schools, and, and, and everything else. Why, why would God choose to bless a country or a nation? Well, we need to get back to Christianity, and we need to be getting back to making Christianity biblical Again, because what's happening these days in the so-called Christian churches is that they're throwing out the Bible. They're, 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 there's very, very little, if any, preaching out of God's Word. Usually you might hear one verse and then just a whole bunch of talking. And we need to get back to sound biblical principles. And one of the main themes here and that I'm going to be hitting on is just like Isaiah 51 says, show my people their transgression. If you don't know that you're not right with God, you need to hear about it. And that's a problem in most cases. People show up to church and they get this feel-good message and they go home 
and nothing is different about them. Nothing has changed. Nothing's been enlightened. They haven't, they haven't gotten any real new information. They just might have a warm, fuzzy feeling, and then they go home, and they just live the rest of their week the way that they always have. You know, church ought to be a place that you could come to, you could hear God's word preached, and that word can, can take root in your heart. And you could actually make some differences and make some changes and, and continually try to increase your spirituality, increase your obedience to the Lord and to be more conformed unto the image of his son, because that's the end goal. And, you know, ultimately one day we will be conformed to the image of his son when we lose this sinful flesh. But let's strive, let's work and continue to, to, to go on that path. And to be a blessing to, to other people and to be blessed by God because we actually care about what his word says. Now, the attack is coming on all fronts. I mean, the, the, the wicked ones, the, you know, Satan, the devils, and just everybody who hates God, everyone who wants nothing to do with God, is attacking. They've been attacking the family. They've been attacking the institution of marriage. Divorce has been increasing. Even just having children is, is looked down upon these days. If you have more than like one or two children, um, general just, just keeping pure, keeping virgin, gender roles have been all mixed up. These attacks have been coming, and of course, that's just a few. The attacks are coming very hard against everything that God's word stands for. And one of the things that Satan has done is to even convince Christians that going to church isn't all that important. And I think that's, that's one of the, the main focuses, or it was one of the main focuses, for the devil to get people to think, I don't really have to go to church. And too many people today think that they could sit at home, they could sit in front of their television and watch some TV preacher and think, oh, I went to church today. Guess what? No, you didn't. If you didn't actually get out of your house, Go to a place where people are congregating together, where there's other like-minded believers that go and fellowship and congregate and sing praises to the Lord, and you can hear a man preach the Bible. You did not go to church, and that is not satisfactory in God's eyes to just sit at home and watch TV and think you're going to church. The Bible says in Hebrews chapter 10, that we're not to forsake the assembling of ourselves together. And when you're sitting on the couch and watching TV, you are not assembling with anybody. You are forsaking the assembling of yourselves together, as the manner of some is. But now, especially in these days, the Bible says, and so much the more as you see the day approaching, we need to be in church. We need to be hearing from God's word. We need to be listening and have our ears perked up and being ready to hear what God has for us to do and not just getting lazy and thinking that church isn't all that important. I was just out soul winning last week and ran into, so I was two weeks ago maybe, and, and ran into to someone with the same type of an attitude. Oh, well, I don't have to go to church. And I, you know. Well, then why did God dedicate entire portions, even chapters of scripture into what it takes for a bishop to, to run a church and who's qualified to be a bishop, who's qualified to be an elder, who's qualified to be a deacon. And they have offices and roles. In 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 5, the Bible says, For if a man know not how to rule his own house, how shall he take care of the church of God? It sounds like it's kind of important. There's a lot of other rules there about being a pastor, about being what the Bible calls a bishop. Someone who is not a striker, they're not greedy for money, they're not a drunkard. Okay, all of these things, they're, they're, and there's many more rules. Read 1 Timothy chapter 3. But the Bible says they need to be, they need to be a husband of one wife. They need to have children, and you know, their children can't be accused of riot or unruly. They can't just be you know, all over the place and not well disciplined because the Bible says that if a man knows not how to rule his own house, how shall he take care of the church of God? Meaning, hey, the church of God is important and you need someone to come to rule in the, in the house of God. And you're not getting that at home. You're not getting that when you invite your friends over. Who's the, who's the bishop of your church then? For all these people who say, oh, I don't have to go to church. Going to church isn't that important anyways. Who's in charge? Who's the bishop? Who is ordained? Who had hands laid on them? 
Because those are all things that the Bible talks about. Those are all things. If you want to do things biblical, this is, hey, this is what we're talking about. Making Christianity biblical again. Not just coming up with our own Burger King style, have it your way Christianity. Let's do things God's way. Same chapter, 1 Timothy 3, verse 15 says, But if I tarry long, that thou mayest know how thou oughtest to behave thyself in the house of God, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and ground of the truth. The church of the living, the church of the living God, the Bible says, is the pillar and ground of the truth. Does that sound like it's important? Important place to be, maybe? A place where you have the pillar and ground of the truth, the church of the living God. Hey, church is important. You need to be getting to church. That's where your growth is going to begin. The Bible even says in Ephesians chapter 5, in the famous passage that talks about husbands and wives and their di different roles, well, it, it tells us and explains us there that Jesus Christ gave himself for the church. Now, I don't know how anyone could say church is not important when Jesus Christ gave his life for the church, according to Ephesians 5, verse 25, which reads, Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it. Jesus Christ gave himself for the church. It sounds like something that maybe we should hold a little bit more valuable, a little bit more sacred. Wow, if Jesus Christ offered up himself and gave himself for the church and loved the church, then maybe we ought to get off our couches and get ourselves into church. Maybe we ought to treat it a little bit more important. Hey, maybe we ought to be a little bit crazy and go to church even more than once a week. You know, we offer church Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night. We've got all kinds of different services. If Jesus Christ gave himself for the church, hey, maybe we ought to think, maybe that's pretty important. Maybe we ought to be in church so much the more as we see the day approaching. Maybe you ought to see more value to gathering together, to being edified by other believers, by hearing God's word preached, and to getting under the sound of a man of God. And not only are people being taught, well, church isn't that important. What people that do decide to go to church are even looking for when it comes to a church is just completely backwards. It has nothing to do with scripture. I, that's probably the number one thing that I hear when people ask about our church, again, when we're out knocking on doors and, and trying to give the gospel to people is, oh, what kind of programs do you have for the kids? Now look, kids are important. The youth is important. But we ought not to just be focused on what type of activities, who can I drop my kids off with so that they can go and have fun. That's ultimately what people are looking for. Oh, I want there to be, you know, a little bit of Jesus, a little bit of good teaching, but a lot of fun, and I want my kids just to really like going there. And you know what? People are looking for that. They're looking for these places. And it's, just, it's just all fun, 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 fun. The kids run around. They act crazy, and they, they go off in their other room or whatever. And then when the kids grow up and get old, guess what they're looking for in a church? They're looking for the big fun center. They don't want to just sit down and sit and listen to a sermon be preached for an hour because guess what? That's going to be boring to them. That's not what the kids need. The kids actually need to be coming in to a church service. And, and don't sell the kids short. Kids can learn a lot, and kids learn a real lot from the preaching. My own children are always coming up to me and telling me about different things that they've learned in church. So, yes, they sit through adult church, and they learn, and it's good for them. And they're, they're learning from a young age what it's like to be in a real church with someone who loves God and loves people and is not willing to withhold anything from God's word just so that some people don't get offended. We're gonna, we love God's word. If you, if you love God's word, say amen this morning. Amen. amen. I love God's word. I, I don't care if this book offends anybody else. I don't care who gets, I don't care if everybody in the entire world gets offended by what's written in this book. I love this book because this book brings life. The word of God is sown in our hearts that provides life. It provides eternal life for us. Jesus Christ, the Bible says, is the word. He is the embodiment of the word of God. I love Jesus and I love the Bible. And I don't care what anybody else has to say and I don't care if anyone wants to attack me for it. Go ahead. Because I love God's word. 
I have this feeling, and I hope it's right, that there are a lot of believers out there. There's a lot of people who are saved that are putting their trust in Jesus Christ that are getting sick of not being able to find a church where someone is willing to just preach what the Bible actually says and is not going to skip over the parts that might offend people. Now, I say that you know, half-heartedly because I would to God, people wouldn't be getting upset that because there's an abundance of, of, of churches out there with preachers that are able to just stand up and sell out for God and preach the whole counsel of God. That's the, the, the true desire. But I hope that where there are lack, where there is a lack of good churches, where there is a lack of a man of God who's, who's able to just, to just preach God's word, I hope there are people who are disgruntled. I hope there are people who are upset about it. I, I hope there are souls out there that are vexed because they want to hear God's word being preached and they're sick of these politician type preachers. Because what does a politician do? A politician tries to please everybody or please as many people as possible. That's what politicians are. They're men pleasers. They're definitely not God pleasers. But see, we don't need man pleasers behind the pulpit today. We don't need people who just want to tell everyone everything they want to hear and tickle their ears and make them feel good, rub their belly and just send them off home. That's not going to do anybody any good. We need someone who's going to be willing to stand behind the pulpit and be a God pleaser and be able to, to read and study God's word and say, wow, there's things that are really lacking. Wow, God, we have a lot of sin. We need to get right with you. And I'm going to preach and tell the people, thus saith the Lord. This is what the Bible says. Politician type preachers are too afraid to offend anyone. And all they want to do is sugarcoat and cherry pick verses out of the Bible to then be able to say, oh, well, I'm still preaching the Bible. And look, there's a lot of great news in the Bible. Don't get me wrong. And we need to, but we need to hear all of it. Amen. We need to hear the good news and the, and the encouraging news. We also need to hear the bad news. The news that says, you're wrong. The news that says, hey, you're in sin and you better get right with God because our God is like a flame of fire. Our God is a God of, of love. He's also a God of hate. He's a God of anger and he's a God of compassion. And he has both. And don't ever forget that he has both. Because when you get too one-sided on who God is, you're going to allow yourself to get into way more trouble than, than you'd, you're going to want. Turn back, if you would, to Isaiah chapter 30. Isaiah chapter number 30. We're going to turn to a few passages, Isaiah 30, then we're going to look at Micah chapter 2, about a people who don't want to hear a good preacher, who don't want to hear a prophet, who don't want to hear someone preach God's word, and the prophets that are willing to just go along with it. There's many examples of this in the Bible. And there's nothing new under the sun, and the things that were are the same things that are going on today. Isaiah chapter 30, verse number 8, the Bible reads, Now go. Write it before them in a table and note it in a book that it may be for the time to come forever and ever that this is a rebellious people, lying children, children that will not hear the law of the Lord. Now, if we are at this place where there's people who just don't want to hear the law of the Lord, no politician is going to make America great again. We have to have soft hearts. We have to have humble hearts that's willing to hear the law of the Lord, in order to get right with God, in order for God to bless us. Because guess what? When people don't want to hear the law of the Lord, God's not going to bless that people. He never has and he never will. Verse number 10, which say to the seers, this is the same people that have the rebellious, the rebellious heart, the lying children. They don't want to hear the word of the Lord, the law of the Lord. They say to the seers, see not, and to the prophets, prophesy not unto us right things, Speak unto us smooth things. Prophesy deceits. See, there's, there's a big market for the false prophet who doesn't care about the word of the Lord to come along and just fill a position and just prophesy deceits or prophesy lies. Because that's what a lot of people want to hear. 
They don't want to be convicted. They don't want to, to think that they're doing anything wrong. They just want to be patted on the back and sent along their way and feel spiritual somehow and invoke God's name and somehow feel that everything is going well with them and that they're doing right by God. Let's keep reading here. Verse number 11. The Bible says, Get you out of the way. Turn aside out of the path. Cause the Holy One of Israel to cease from before us. Wherefore, thus saith the Holy One of Israel, because ye despise this word and trust in oppression and perverseness and stay thereon, therefore this iniquity shall be to you as a breach ready to fall, swelling out in a high wall, whose breaking cometh suddenly at an instant. And he shall break it as the breaking of the potter's vessel that is broken in pieces. He shall not spare, so that there shall not be found in the bursting of it assured to take fire from the hearth or to take water with all out of the pit. For thus saith the Lord God, the Holy One of Israel, in returning and rest shall ye be saved, in quietness and in confidence shall be your strength, and ye would not. God makes it easy, but people's wicked hearts make it hard on themselves. He says, in returning and rest ye shall be saved. Just turn to God. Put your rest in Him. Cease from your own works. Trust in the faith of Jesus Christ to be saved. And in quietness and in confidence shall be your strength. But ye would not. And that's what happens to this people. And of course, God does not bless that people. The, they, they, they're cursed and they go into captivity and they have all kinds of problems as a result. Micah chapter 2, verse 6. We're going to see something very similar. Micah 2, 6. The Bible says, Prophesy ye not, say they to them that prophesy. They shall not prophesy to them, that they shall not take shame. O thou that art named the house of Jacob, is the spirit of the Lord straightened? Are these his doings? Do not my words do good to him that walketh uprightly. Even of late my people has risen up as an enemy. Ye pull off the robe with the garment from them that pass by securely as men averse from war. The women of my people have cast out from their pleasant houses, from their children have ye taken away my glory forever. Now look, this is not a, a, a good message. This is not the message that people have been wanting to hear, but he's telling them the truth. And this is what people need to decide. Do you want to go and hear a lie preach that's going to make you feel good, or do you just want to hear the truth from God's own mouth? Do you want to hear the truth from God's word? This is why we even have the name of the church that we have, Word of Truth Baptist Church. Why? Because we preach the truth. And if that offends people, so be it. If people don't want to hear that, well, then that's on you. But I'm not going to withhold truth from anybody. I'm not going to hold back on God's Word. That's not my job. My job is to preach God's Word. Turn, if you would, to 2 Timothy chapter 4. Second Timothy chapter 4 shows us the charge for the preachers and what they ought to be focused on and what they ought to care about. And this is the formula for churches to get right with God. Second Timothy chapter number 4. Second Timothy chapter 4, verse number 1, the Bible reads, I charge thee therefore before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall judge the quick and the dead at his appearing and his kingdom. Preach the word. Be instant in season, out of season. Reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. This is the instruction from the Apostle Paul to Timothy, who was a pastor of a church. And he's telling him, hey, Timothy, Preach the word. Preach the Bible. Don't just preach out of your heart and just preach whatever things that you just, just have an opinion on. Preach God's word. He says, be instant in season and out of season. Hey, whether it's popular or not, there's always different times where some parts of God's word is popular and times where some parts of God's word is not popular. It doesn't matter whether it's in season or out of season. You preach the word. And then he tells them, reprove rebuke, 
Both of those words are telling people that they're wrong. Hey, tell people that they're wrong. Reprove people. Prove to them out of the Bible that they're wrong, why, what they're in sin about. Rebuke people. Tell people sharply that they're wrong, that they're not doing things right, that they need to follow God's word, that they're, they're, they're in error. And then exhort. Exhort is the encouragement. But notice two out of the three things he's telling them to do are not positive they're negative. Now, the end result should be positive. The whole point of telling people and telling the house of Jacob their transgressions and my people their sins and to laying this out and the spelling out is so that we can get right with God. It's so that we can be better and, and more blessed in God's eyes. That's the whole point. And he says to do this with all long suffering and doctrine. Doctrine is important. If you're in a church where you're not getting good doctrine, then you need to leave that church because doctrine is important. Verse number three, for the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine. Why? This time is coming. I believe this time is upon us when people just can't endure sound doctrine. What does that mean? They can't stand to hear it. They hear God's word preach. They hear a man of God who's not holding back, who's just preaching everything that this book says, but people can't endure it. They can't handle it. They get angry. They get mad. They don't want to have anything to do with it. And let's see what they do here in, um, in, first, in 2 Timothy 4.3. They will not endure sound doctrine, but after their own lusts shall they heap to themselves teachers having itching ears. And they shall turn away their ears from the truth and shall be turned unto fables. This is talking about people in the latter times, which again, I believe we're in latter times right now, that they're not going to care what the truth is. They're going to get teachers that are willing to stand up and teach them lies. And that's the way they want it to be. Now, I have a hard time even understanding that mindset. I've never been the type of person who's just wanted to have been lied to. I don't know about you, but again, you know, even before I got saved, I wanted to know what the truth was. What is, wh who is God? What, is there, is there a right religion? And in my seeking, I just wanted to know what the truth was. And even coming, being brought up in a Christian home, I didn't just automatically assume that Christianity was correct because I just wanted to know what's right. I mean, hey, if the God of Islam is the God of the universe, then I just want to know that. If the, if the, if the God of, um, you know, Buddha or the God of any of these Eastern religions, if that who, what the truth is, if that's where the truth lies, then that's all I want to know. Because I just want to know what's right. I don't need anyone to tell me something to comfort me. You know, the atheists are always trying to tell you, oh, you just need to have explanations and to feel comfortable. And that's why you make up this God and stuff. No, it's not. I'd be, you know, whatever, whatever is true and whatever is right, that's what I care about. Amen. But I'll tell you what, the Bible is true. God is true. Jesus Christ is true. And more people need to hear about him. Jeremiah chapter 14. Actually, you know what? Don't turn to Jeremiah 14. I'm, uh, I'm getting a little bit behind here. I want to I move forward. Jeremiah, of course, we have multiple examples of preachers that prophesy lies and they, they even use the name of the Lord, but God didn't send them. And there's a lot of that going on today. Um, turn, if you would, to 2 Thessalonians chapter 3. 2 Thessalonians chapter 3 in the New Testament. 2 Thessalonians chapter number 3. Because what we need today in order to make Christianity biblical again is a lot more teaching from God's word, a lot more of just hearing the parts of the Bible that I think have gotten a lot of dust because preachers are afraid to preach on these things. Because there's been a lot of withholding of God's word. Because there's been a lot of tickling of ears. And we need to get right. And if we want... If we want this country to be great again, we need to hear these things. It may sting a little bit, but this is what's necessary. We need the truth from God's word. We need to be able to, to, to say, thus saith the Lord. And hey, if that means calling out a bum for being a bum, then so be it. You know, people have gotten so soft these days and no one wants to offend anybody to that even if, you just, if you're just to call out someone as being a bum on the street who's, who's not willing to work. And when I say a bum, I mean someone who's lazy, someone who's addicted to drugs or alcohol or whatever, and they don't want to work, and all they care about is themselves, and they're flushing their life down the toilet, and people expect you just to, 
to continue to give money to these people and to help them out, you're not even helping them. If you just continue to enable somebody to go down that path, some able-bodied young man, and you know, we got a lot of this in Arizona. Young men in their 20s, fully capable of working, sitting out on the side of the road with a sign and just panhandling and getting, you know what? They're bums. And I'll say it, they're bums. Why? Because they're not willing to go out and work. In this country, if you are willing to work, guaranteed you can find a job. I don't care who you are. I see the examples from time to time of good godly men who are willing to work, who get fired, you know, something happens, they lose their job, and you know what? They're working within a day. Why? Because once they don't have a job anymore, their full-time job becomes getting a full-time job. Because they're not just sitting and, oh, what do I do? Oh, I wonder if I could get money from the government. Oh, I wonder if I could collect some welfare. Don't be collecting welfare from the government, you lazy bum. If you're able to work, then get to work. Provide for yourself. The Bible says in 2 Thessalonians, look, you want scripture on this? Okay, here's some scripture. 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, verse number 10. The Bible says, For even when we were with you, this we commanded you, that if any would not work, neither should he eat. Where's the love and compassion? Hey, if you're not willing to work, then you're not going to eat. That's their love and compassion. Why? Because they're trying to teach people because what they need isn't just some meal. What they need is some character. What they need is to get up off the rear end and get to work and provide for themselves and not be relying on other people to take care of them. We need to stop giving money to the freeloaders and think that you're helping anybody because you're not helping them. If you really do care about these people, because I'm not saying I don't care about them, I do care about them. That's why I'll call them a bum to their face. Because sometimes they might need to be slapped with a little sense of reality from time to time to get off their rear end and maybe something can sink down into their hearts and say, yeah, you know what? Maybe I ought to change and do something different. Maybe if people aren't willing to just give me a whole bunch of money and if our government wasn't just giving people a bunch of money to sit around and do nothing, then people might actually get up and get to work and be productive. But it starts with people willing to say the truth. And you know what? Sometimes the truth hurts. But the truth is the truth. And we're either going to stand for it or not. And I'm not going to withhold any of it. The Bible says if there's, if, if there's a man that's not taking care of his family, he says that they're worse than an infidel. And, if, and, and unbelievable. think about what does God do with unsaved people, with people who don't put their faith on the Lord Jesus Christ? He sends them to hell for eternity. 1 Timothy 5, verse number 8, the Bible says, But if any provide not for his own, and specially for those of his own house, he hath denied the faith and is worse than an infidel. He's worse. If, you, if you're not willing to take care of your own family, and just get up and get to work and work hard for your family, the Bible says you're worse than an infidel. That's God's word. That's not even my words. God's saying you're worse than an infidel if you're not willing to provide for your family. Turn if you would to Ephesians chapter 5. Ephesians chapter 5. We need to have standards again. Again, the attack and the brainwashing has been coming in saying you need to tolerate everything and be so accepting and be loving and oh, you don't want to turn anyone away and, and you might offend somebody and you know, this is the path that churches have been going down and this is why our country continues to devolve because there's not people willing to say, you know what? No, I've got standards. No, we're, we're, we're going to call sin a sin. If it's wicked, it's wicked. And I don't care if it's my brother. I don't care if it's my mother. I don't care if it's my daughter. I don't care who the person is. If they're in wickedness and sin, according to the Bible, then that's what it is. And we're not going to withhold because it's someone we know. Or we're not going to withhold because someone just came and visited church for the first time. Maybe that's what they need to hear. Maybe that's why they came in. You can't be worried about people leaving. Oh, they might get offended and leave. That's their problem. If you're preaching God's word, you're not responsible for what that person does with God's word. But our, our responsibility is to preach God's word. 
Ephesians chapter 5, verse number 3, the Bible says, but fornication. Fornication, yeah, there's something that we have a problem with these days. You know, there used to be a time, and for the younger people, it's probably mind-boggling. There used to be a time where you would call a, a, a girl that slept around with guys a whore, a harlot, a prostitute. There is a time where, you know, even with guys, you know, going off and, and being a whoremonger was not a good thing. These days, what do you see? It's normal. These days, they're passing out prophylaxis. They're, they're, they're passing out birth control in high schools and probably even grade schools at this point. I don't know. I remember having debates about this in high school, even as an unsafe. But just to show you how far the culture has shifted in a very short period of time, when I was in high school in Chicago in the 90s, in our speech classes, we had this debate, and, and one of the things that came up is, should um, birth control be offered in high school? That was when it was coming up. It was in the mid-90s. And I remember, even as an unsaved person, but had a decent family and, and parents that, that had, you know, more old-fashioned mindset, it was ridiculous. Of course not. What are, you, what are you saying to people when you start offering up birth control? Well, Go ahead and, and, and commit fornication, and we're going to help you to not um, have any consequences as a result of your sin. That's, what, that's what's being, being spoken loud and clear. Instead of saying, no, we're drawing a line, this is unacceptable. There's a standard here, and you're not going to commit fornication in high school. You're going you're gonna to wait and remain pure, and we're going to exalt purity. We're going to exalt virgin. And we're going we're to exalt good behavior, and we're going to condemn bad behavior, and we're not going to make it any easier for you to get into sin. Ephesians 5.3, but fornication and all uncleanness or covetousness, let it not be once named among you as becometh saints. You know what? That's something that the world can go ahead and get involved in. But for you as a believer in Jesus Christ, that ought not to be named even once among you. No fornication. No, it's not normal, parents, for your kids to just go off and sleep around. And yes, you are failing Parents, if your kids are doing that behavior, shame on you if you're born again and your children are off in fornication. It ought not to even be named among you as become a saint. But you know what? The parents aren't hearing this down at their local church. And their kids are going off into the world. They're influenced by the world. And nobody's hearing the truth from, from God's word. There's a lack. There's a void. And they get sucked along with everybody else and swept up in the worldly philosophies of just thinking, well, they're going to do it anyway, so let's just try to make it safe for them. Yeah, getting into sin, you know what? I don't care how safe you try to make it. When you're getting into sin, you're not safe from God. Okay, God has consequences for you breaking his laws. And no matter how much you try to make things safe, it ain't going to happen. Verse number four, neither filthiness, nor foolish talking, nor jesting, which are not convenient, but rather giving of thanks. For this ye know that no whoremonger, yeah, whoremonger, there's a word. You know what? It's a Bible word, and we ought to get back to using that word. It ought to be unacceptable for people to be sleeping around and whoring around when they're not married, having physical relationships. For this you know that no whoremonger, nor unclean person, nor covetous man who is an idolater hath any inheritance in the kingdom of God, the kingdom of Christ and of God. People need more of a fear of the Lord. Come back tonight because I'm going to be preaching on that this evening. The Bible says in 1 Corinthians 7 verse 1, Now concerning the things where you wrote unto me, it is good for a man not to touch a woman. That's what's good. That's what's right. Instead of telling these kids, oh, you shouldn't touch a woman, but, but here's some birth control. Here's something to help protect you in case you do. No, it's good for a man not to have a woman. Nevertheless, to avoid fornication, let every man have his own wife and let every woman have her own husband. You say, fine, 
You want to do it that bad? You want to have that type of physical relationship? Fine, but you're going to get married first because you're going to avoid fornication. Let every man and the, let every man have his own wife. It doesn't say let every man have his own husband. Let every man have his own wife and let every woman have her own husband. Amen. This is the way the Bible defines marriage. How about adultery, divorce? Malachi 2.16 says, For the Lord, the God of Israel, saith that he hateth putting away, for one covereth violence with his garment, saith the Lord of hosts. Therefore, take heed to your spirit that ye deal not treacherously. God hates, what does it mean? When the Bible says God hates putting away, that means God hates divorce. God does not want people to get divorced. While we're on the marriage subject, you know, we just saw let every man have his own wife and let every woman have her own husband. And when you vow a vow to your spouse, it's until death do you part. Amen. That's a vow that you make to your spouse and before God. And the Bible says that we ought to keep our vows. Because otherwise, what good is your word if you're just some stinking liar that's not willing to keep your vows and your oaths that you make? God hates putting away. God hates divorce. God doesn't want people to be divorced. God, at the beginning, made them male and female. And he says, For this cause shall a man leave his father and mother and cleave unto his wife, and they too shall become one flesh. That's God's will. God's will is not people getting divorced. Leviticus 20, verse 10, the Bible says, And a man that committeth adultery with another man's wife, even he that committeth adultery with his neighbor's wife, the adulterer and the adulteress shall surely be put to death. Let me read that again. And let that sink in. Because you know what you're being just bombarded with on a regular basis, especially if you're turning on the television? You're being bombarded with the normalization of adultery. Of people who are married going off and having affairs. Having secret relationships. Mistresses. And you find this in the news. You find this all over the place where people... Uh, you, I mean, it's, it's normalized on TV. What, what is it? There's always these dramas. And what happens? You've got some husband or some wife that they go and they cheat on their spouse... And then they have all these problems with drama. People just love it and eat it up and they watch it. And then you have the, the excuses being made. Oh, my husband isn't giving me enough attention. And, and, and they, look, they put this in front of your eyes. They put situations out there that are real life situations where people might be going through a hard time in their life. And then you see people on the screen dealing with it by going off and cheating on their spouse. And then they get a divorce and then they, they get their kids and then they're raising their kids by themselves and they're doing all this stuff. And that is what you are being, what, what is being promoted and what you're being taught by Hollywood, by the movies, by the TV. But let's read again what the Bible says about adultery and those that commit adultery. The Bible says, And the man that committeth adultery with another man's wife, even he that committeth adultery with his neighbor's wife, the adulterer and the adulteress shall surely be put to death. That's how God feels about adultery. That's what God's law says about adultery is that, you know what, if someone is going to cheat on their spouse by lying carnally with another person that's not their spouse, they ought to be put to death. The adulterer and the adulteress, both of them are both guilty and they both ought to die. That's how serious adultery is according to God in the Bible. Are you hearing that today? Does anyone even know that? Or is it just another option for married people? Well, I'm not getting the attention I need, so I'm going to get it from someone else. Because that's the attitude that's being promoted in music and in movies and in our culture at large. And you know what? That's one of the reasons why people have no respect for American culture anymore around the world. You wonder why America's hated? One reason is because we're bombing kids all over the world. And another reason is because our culture stinks. It's morally depraved. And people who don't even believe on the Lord Jesus Christ can see that in other cultures. And other religions can see how perverted and disgusting what's being promoted here really is and how damaging it is. Look, adultery is bad. Adultery ruins lives and relationships. And it's so bad, that's why the Bible puts the death penalty on it. But people hear the Old Testament preached or they hear hard preaching and they claim, oh, well, you're not being very Christ-like. 
That's just the way the Old Testament was. In the New Testament, you know, Jesus, Jesus didn't, didn't talk like that, really. Turn, if you would, to Luke chapter 16. Don't forget that they killed Jesus. When you accuse people of not being very Christ-like when they're preaching sermons and they're saying, hey, when you commit adultery, you deserve to be put to death. That is loving, my friends, because for those that have not committed adultery yet, for those that are married and, and, and have not done this, maybe this will put a little fear of the Lord in you not to do it and say, wow, I didn't realize how big of a deal this actually is. Maybe I won't do that. Maybe I won't treat my marriage like I was dating girls when I was off fornicating in school because everyone said that that's normal and that's okay. Even Jesus himself said, the world cannot hate you, but me it hateth. You think Jesus was just loved by everybody? No. They hated Jesus enough to, to, to whip him and beat him and scourge him and nail him to a cross to die an excruciating death. Does that sound like love to you? Now, of course he had followers. Of course people did, did love him and believe on him. But overall, he came to his own, and his own received him not. He was rejected. He was cast out. He was evil and treated. And he says, But me it hateth, because I testify of it that the works thereof are evil. Jesus Christ, out of his own mouth, said, The world hates me because I testify, I preach against it, I preach that the world, that the works, are evil. They're bad. They're wrong. They're wicked. They're sinful. That's why the world hates Jesus. That's why the world still hates Jesus today, because he testifies of righteousness and he testifies that the, the works of the world are wicked. And people don't like to hear that. When you're living in darkness, you don't like the shine, the, the light to shine on your darkness. People just want to keep that hidden. But Jesus brought light into the world. And our, the, the commandment to us is that we need to be lights to shine forth in the darkness. But we were talking about adultery as people say, oh, well, what, that's, that's not the way it is in the New Testament. Well, look what Jesus Christ said in Luke chapter 16. See, if you thought that was rough about the death penalty being placed on, on adultery, look at who Jesus even considers to be adulterers. Look at Luke 16, verse number 15. And you know what? This, is, this gets crickets. This, this, this passage is skipped over, guaranteed, in churches all across the country. You know why? Because there are so many people that are guilty of this that there's too many preachers that are afraid to even say what Jesus Christ himself said in Luke chapter 16. Let's look at verse number 15. The Bible says, And he said unto them, Ye are they which justify yourselves before men. But God knoweth your hearts, for that which is highly esteemed among men is abomination in the sight of God. Now let that sink in. People will criticize, oh, you small fundamental church, you know, no one even takes you seriously anyways. You're not highly esteemed among men. Well, good, because Jesus said that which is highly esteemed among men is abomination in the sight of God. Hey, when all people are speaking well of you and everybody loves you, you're doing something wrong. Because the Bible says that that's what they did to the false prophets. That everybody loves the false prophet. Everybody loves the Joel Osteen and the Billy Graham. Why? Because they're false prophets. Because the world loves them because they're of the world. But the world can't love a real prophet, a real preacher. Why? Because they're going to be testifying that the, the, the ways of the world are wickedness, just like Jesus Christ did. But let's keep reading here in Luke 16, verse number 16. The Bible says, The law and the prophets were until John. Since that time the kingdom of God is preached, and every man presseth into it. And it is easier for heaven and earth to pass than one tittle of the law to fail. It is easier for heaven and earth. How easy is it for heaven and earth to just pass away and be gone? Not very easy. It's easier for that to happen than one tittle of the law to fail, is what Jesus Christ preached. 
One small piece, one little tittle of the law to fail. And then he says in verse 18, Whosoever putteth away his wife and marrieth another committeth adultery. Remember, we already read God hates putting away. Whosoever putteth away his wife and marrieth another committeth adultery, and whosoever marrieth her that is put away from her husband committeth adultery. How does God feel about divorce? How does Jesus feel about divorce? He says, if you divorce your wife and go marry someone else, you're committing adultery. How's that for being Christ-like? Have you ever heard that before? If you haven't, it's probably because people are withholding truth from you. Now this is a teaching, is sound doctrine, out of Jesus Christ's own mouth, multiple times, this is only one reference, this has driven people away from our church on more than one occasion. And I, probably, I figured that that would probably happen, but you know what? I'm not going to withhold truth from anybody because they needed to hear that. And those people, I don't know what happened to them that, that were falling in the situation. They hadn't even done this yet. They were looking to get married, but one of them had been divorced before, and I showed them this verse. It made them sad, but you know what? They know what the truth is. They know how God feels about it, and I'm not going to lie to them and try to make everything feel comfortable and, and tickle their ears and bless them when God's not going to bless them and make them think that everything's good. When it's not. Turn, if you would, to 1 Corinthians chapter 5. Going back to having standards, having standards among believers, among Christians. You know, you expect everything under the sun in the world, but not in the house of God. Not among those who actually believe that this book is true. Not those that love God's word and want to listen to what God has to say. There ought to be a standard for those people, for believers. 1 Corinthians 5.11 gives us part of the standard about people who we shouldn't even eat with. Why? Because we don't want to encourage really, really bad behavior. Yes, we're all sinners, but no, we're not all fornicators. Yes, we're all sinners, but no, we're not all drunkards. The Bible says in 1 Corinthians 5, verse 11, But now I have written unto you not to keep company. If any man that is called a brother, see, so this isn't just the world. This is someone who's called a brother, someone who's a brother in Christ or a sister in Christ. Someone who's called a brother be a fornicator or covetous, always wanting stuff that they can't have or an idolater, or a railer, or a drunkard. Yeah, someone who's a drunkard. And you don't have to be an AA to be a drunkard. You go out, when your intent is to get drunk, you're a drunkard. You don't have to be drinking every single day and be addicted to alcohol to be a drunkard. Or an extortioner with such an one, no, not to eat. Oh, but I want to help them. Look, when they're, when they're called a brother and they're involved in this type of sin, says, don't even eat with them. If you want to help them, then you won't even eat with them. Because they need to realize how bad their sin stinks. That it's actually so bad that I can't have anything to do with you. Why? Because that's what the Bible said. Now, we're not going to go and add our own list and add our own sins to this and, oh, you're doing this. This is enough. But we're going to be biblical. If we're going to make Christianity biblical again, then we're going to hold to these standards. Which is why if there's a known brother or sister in Christ that's just some drunkard, they're not going to be welcome in church. Why? Because we have a standard in place that is biblical. Because we're trying to make Christianity biblical again. Amen. Verse 12, For what have I to do to judge them also that are without? Do not ye judge them that are within? Oh, I thought we're not supposed to judge. I thought we're not supposed to judge. Do not ye judge them that are within, but them that are without God judgeth. Therefore, put away from among yourselves that wicked person. How dare you, Paul, Apostle Paul, judge someone and call someone wicked? 
Well, he's speaking through the inspiration of the Holy Ghost. When he's calling people that are committing these sins, that are brothers, that they're wicked. They're wicked. And yes, we ought to judge. We need more Christians to judge righteous judgment as Jesus Christ said to do. Jesus said, judge not according to the appearance, but judge righteous judgment. Yes, we do judge. We need to judge. We need to judge right from wrong. We need to judge a situation. We need to judge if someone is in terrible sin, whether or not I'm even going to eat dinner with that person or not. We need to judge. God has given us brains. God has given us his law and God has given us right judgment and we need to utilize this in his word in order to execute sound judgment. We need to stop being brainwashed that nobody can ever judge. This is the agenda of the sodomites, of the homosexuals. That's what's being pushed. That's what's being crammed down your throat for decades. This that concept of don't judge, don't judge. That's, where, that's ultimately where it comes from. It comes from wicked people that hate God that don't want to hear about their sin. Say, so, oh, you can't judge, don't judge me. That's where it comes from. And you know what? This isn't new. It may be a newer phenomenon within our country now, but this has been around forever and this has been their MO for a long time, the homo, the sodomite, going all the way back to, to Sodom and Gomorrah where we get the term sodomite from because they're from Sodom. Genesis 19 verse 9 when all the men of the city compassed about the house where the two angels came in to Lot's house and they were beating on the door and saying, let those men out here. No, we want to know them, which means they wanted to abuse them. They wanted to rape the angels that came into Lot's house. All the men, young and old, surrounded Lot's house because that's what the sodomite is like. Don't believe the lies Oh, they're cute. They're funny. They're just like everyone else. No, they're not. No, they're not. Romans 1 explains that they're filled with all unrighteousness. Amen. But in Genesis 19.9, when Lot was trying to, to, to appease the crowd and say, look, don't do this. He said, don't do so wickedly to these men. Here is their response. And they said, stand back. And they said again, this one fellow came in to sojourn and he will needs be a judge in reference to Lot. They're saying, oh, this guy just came in our town to stay here and now he's going to be a judge hmm? because he told them that they were doing wickedly. The sodomite has always used this, oh, you're, now you're going to be a judge. Oh, don't judge me. Well, no, we need to judge. Here's God's judgment, Leviticus 20, 13. If a man also lie with mankind as he lieth with a woman, both of them have committed an abomination. They shall surely be put to death. Their blood shall be upon them. That's God's judgment. That's what God deems is appropriate for the sodomite. Just like an adulterer. Let them be put to death. This is what civil government laws ought to be following, is the laws of the Lord. This is justice. This is God's judgment. That's what they deserve. These are the equal punishments for their crimes. Because sodomites are predators. And it is a crime for a man to lie carnally with another man. It's disgusting. It's perverted. It makes me sick to my stomach. But... Regardless of, of, of even that, of, of the repulsion factor, God's word said so. And that's what we care about. And you think again, oh, that's just Old Testament. You know, people always, they, they hear the, the, the Old Testament and their brains just turn off and they just want to not listen anymore. Oh, that's Old Testament. Well, how about in Jude, verse 7, the Bible says, even as Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities about them in like manner, giving themselves over to fornication and going after strange flesh are set forth for an example suffering the vengeance of eternal fire in the new testament he says you know what sodom gomorrah and all those cities that had fire and brimstone rain on them out of heaven those were done as an example for us why because god hasn't changed his mind on the subject he didn't think oh wow this is an abomination this is horrible they need to be put to death i'm going to rain fire and brimstone on them you know, a couple thousand years ago, and now he's just like, 
oh, they're great, love them, allow them in the church and allow them among your children and now everything's just fine and don't judge them. God doesn't change. Especially between two complete polar opposites like that. Romans 1 explains it all. And this is, this is the truth that people need to understand about the sodomite. This is the truth that people need to hear about the homosexual. Romans 1, 26 reads, For this cause God gave them up unto vile affections, for even their women did change the natural use into that which is against nature. It's not natural. This isn't normal sin that people do. It's, it's against nature. And the only reason they even commit these vile acts are because God gave them up to those vile affections. That's why. They wouldn't normally have done that. But when they rejected God, God rejected them and then gave them up unto vile affections. Verse 27, And likewise also the men, leaving the natural use of the woman, burned in their lust one toward another, men with men, working that which is unseemly, and receiving in themselves that recompense of their error, which was meat. And again, this is all New Testament, by the way, my friends. And even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a reprobate mind to do those things which are not convenient, being filled with all unrighteousness. This is explaining the people who were given up by God to dishonor their bodies between themselves and, and doing those things that are against nature. This, this describes who these people are. Being filled with all unrighteousness, fornication, wickedness, covetousness, maliciousness, full of envy, murder, debate, deceit, malignity, whispers, backbiters, haters of God, despiteful, proud, boasters, inventors of evil things, disobedient to parents, without understanding, covenant breakers, without natural affection, implacable, unmerciful, who knowing the judgment of God that they which commit such things are worthy of death, not only do the same, but have pleasure in them that do them. You might say, oh, well, other people do some of the things on that list. That's not what this is saying, though. What this is saying is that those people are, are, do all of the things on this list. That this describes that person. You may be guilty of one or two things on this list. But the sodomite, this, all of these things describe the sodomite. All of them. Because they're filled with all unrighteousness. Amen. And then at the end it says, they know the judgment of God. They know. They've heard. Why? Because they've rejected God. They know all about it and they've rejected it. That they which commit such things are worthy of death not only do the same, they don't care. They know that the things that they do are worthy of death in God's eyes. They don't care. And not only do they not care, not only are they unashamed, but they have pleasure in others that do the same thing. They have pleasure in those that do them. Now, old Christian... This is where you come in. You say, yeah, I'm not a reprobate. Good, I know. If you're a believer in Jesus Christ, you can't be a reprobate. But are you having pleasure in the reprobates? Is that what you use for your entertainment? Are you listening to these sodomites like Elton John? Like Freddie Mercury? Is that what gives you entertainment? Do you listen to these people that hate God? that were given over to a reprobate mind and you're having pleasure in the things that they produce? Are you having pleasure in, in the filthy, reprobate Hollywood actors like I mentioned last week about Kevin Spacey, the sodomite that goes after young boys? Are you just taking pleasure and watching all of his movies and thinking, wow, how great is he? What a great actor. I'm taking pleasure in a sick, perverted, twisted man that's going after little children because he's a pedophile rapist. This is what we need. We need the standards preached. We need to get right with God. We need to confess and forsake our sins and stop enjoying and getting pleasure out of the, the wicked, perverted entertainment industry of Hollywood and the, the, the music industry and all the rest of it that's promoted by people who actually hate God. Why would you want to listen to someone that hates God anyways? Just because you like the way a song sounds? How much do you love God? If there's ever going to be any meaningful change, we need to drop this notion that Christ came to destroy the law. 
We're almost done. Matthew chapter 5, verse 17. Jesus Christ, again, words from Jesus Christ himself. Think not that I am come to destroy the law or the prophets. I am not come to destroy, but to fulfill. You know what? We reference a lot of Old Testament this morning. But Jesus didn't come to destroy the law. He came and he paid the curse for the law because we're all cursed because we're all sinners. But God's law still stands. If God's law was destroyed, there wouldn't be sin because sin is the transgression of the law. If there were no law, then how could you even be a sinner? And if you weren't a sinner, then why would you need a savior? The law is our schoolmaster that points us unto Christ. Jesus didn't come to destroy the law. He came to fulfill the law. He says, For verily I say unto you, till heaven and earth pass, one jot or one tittle shall in no wise pass from the law, till all be fulfilled. Whosoever therefore shall break one of these least commandments. Again, out of the mouth of Jesus Christ. Whosoever shall break one of the least commandments and shall teach men so. Oh yeah, it's fine. We can do this. Why? Because the law, that's the Old Testament. The law is gone. He shall be called the least in the kingdom of heaven. But whosoever shall do and teach them, the same shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. If you're a believer in Jesus Christ that thinks that all the law is gone and you don't have to obey any of the law, we don't care about the law anymore, it doesn't mean you're not going to heaven. But you're going to be called least in the kingdom of heaven. Because Why? Because salvation's easy. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved in thy house. But don't go around teaching people and telling people that Jesus came and destroyed the law. Jesus himself said he didn't come to destroy the law, but to fulfill. Jesus himself said, if you break the least of these commandments and teach men so, you're going to be called least. But if you do them, if you do the least of the commandments and you teach them, then he says you're going to be called great in the kingdom of God. If we could turn back to being a country that respected God's laws, we would be respected again in the world. Deuteronomy chapter 4. It's the last place we're going to turn. We're going to read through this and I'm done. Deuteronomy chapter number 4. Don't buy into the concept by the brainwashing that people will say you're crazy because you want to follow God's laws. You're crazy if you think that adulterers should be put to death. You're crazy if you think sodomite should be put to death. You're crazy if you think that kidnappers should be put to death. No, I'm not crazy. I get my sense of morality from the Bible and from God. And my sense of judgment and justice and what's right and what's wrong from God and the Bible. Where do you get your ideas from? Think about that. I've heard other believers give me a hard time about, oh, well, I don't think that homosexuals should be put to death. Well, then wh what do you, who are you to decide what's right and wrong if you're going to contradict what God said in his word of what's right and what's wrong? Deuteronomy chapter 4 should be enough because, again, this is scripture. This is profitable for doctrine. We can see God's commandment after he gave them the law about how it would benefit them and how good it is for them to have and to know and even in the sight of the whole world. Deuteronomy chapter 4, look at verse number 1. The Bible reads, Now therefore hearken, O Israel, unto the statutes and unto the judgments which I teach you, for to do them, that ye may live and go in and possess the land which the Lord God of your fathers giveth you. Ye shall not add unto the word which I command you, neither shall you diminish aught from it, that ye may keep the commandments of the Lord your God, which I command you. Your eyes have seen what the Lord did because of Baal Peor. For all the men that followed Baal Peor, the Lord thy God, hath destroyed them from among you. But ye that did cleave unto the Lord your God are alive, every one of you, this day. Behold, I have taught you statutes and judgments, even as the Lord my God commanded me, that ye should do so in the land whither you go to possess it. Keep therefore and do them, for this is your wisdom and your understanding in the sight of the nations, which shall hear all these statutes and say, Surely this great nation is a wise and understanding people. For what nation is there so great 
who hath God so nigh unto them as the Lord our God is in all things that we call upon him for. And what nation is there so great that hath statutes and judgments so righteous as all this law which I set before you this day? He says, you follow my laws and this is what the other nations are going to see. This is what they're going to think. They're going to say, wow, God must be with them because their laws and their statutes are so right. They're so right on. They fit the crime. We're mocked today for many reasons. But when we're letting child predators out of prison and not putting them to death as they ought to be, put down like the dirty, rotten, filthy, stinking beasts that they are, when we let, we just put them in prison with a slap on the wrist and they're out in a few years and they're spending less time in jail than the guy who's just smoking some pot or whatever and not hurting anybody but, but is just hurting himself, they're in prison longer than these, these people who are, are predators and preying on little children. That's backwards. Of course, who, who has respect for that? I know I don't. I have no respect for a system that, that allows perverts and predators to go back out on the street and just defile more people? No, if, if we follow God's laws, it'll be known that this is what's right. I'm going to keep reading here. Verse number 9, Only take heed to thyself and keep thy soul diligently, lest thou forget the things which thine eyes have seen, and lest they depart from thy heart all the days of thy life. But teach them thy sons and thy sons' sons, especially the day that thou stoodest before the Lord thy God in Horeb, when the Lord said unto me, Gather me the, the people together, and I will make them hear my words, that they may learn to fear me all the days that they shall live upon the earth, and that they may teach their children. This is why we have the children in the church service, because we need to teach the children the same laws that, are, that we need to hear. They need to hear the same preaching, the same teaching. We are teaching our children these things and we're not just sending them off to some Sunday school, some children's church to just sing a bunch of songs and, and, and not learn any good doctrine from the Bible. Verse 11, And you came near and stood under the mountain, and the mountain burned with fire unto the midst of heaven, with darkness, clouds, and thick darkness. And the Lord spake unto you out of the midst of the fire. Ye heard the voice of the words, but saw no similitude, only ye heard a voice. And he declared unto you this, his covenant which he commanded you to perform even ten commandments. And he wrote them upon two tables of stone. And the Lord commanded me at that time to teach you statutes and judgments that you might do them in the land whether you go over to possess it. This is what we need more of. God's commandments. God's statutes. This is what we need to make Christianity biblical again. And if we want to make America great again, it's going to start with the hearts. It's going to start with people turning back to the Lord with a contrite heart and a broken spirit and willing to say, God, we've sinned, but now we want to do what's right. Teach us, O Lord, and show us your precepts. Show us your commandments that we can be right in your eyes and you can truly bless us. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you so much for uh, all of the instruction that you give us. Lord, help us to fight the, the, the world and, the, and the, help us to be strong in the battle, the spiritual battle that's going on for those that, that hate you and want to have nothing to do with you. Dear Lord, help us to stay strong in our faith and our conviction. God, help us all. We know we're not perfect by any means, Lord, but help us to, to be strengthened through your word and through other believers in church, dear Lord. Help us to, to do more for you, dear God, and, um, and, and just teach us your ways. We have an open heart. We're, 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 we're not rejecting your words. We just need to know where we are in error so that we can correct it and get right with you, dear Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.